On July 1, 1981, a chartered Grumman Goose from King Salmon, Alaska ferried U.S. Fish and Wildlife biologist Edgar Bailey and me, volunteer Nina Faust, and our gear to a beach at Kanatic Lagoon, a place the Pacific Coast pilot calls a maelstrom in a northwest storm. Our survey would follow the coastline using a 16-foot inflatable boat with two motors east to McNeil River, a distance of about 250 miles. We set up camp and then checked a nearby offshore island with a small seabird population. By our return, northwest winds began blowing. 4 a.m. winds worsened and piercing blowing drizzle slapped the tent. At 7.30 a.m., 40 to 50 knot winds with 80 knot gusts blasted our exposed camp. We raced to secure the tent and other equipment, but a fierce gust caught the boat sailing it 10 feet into the air and several hundred feet inland while dragging the anchor where it flew through the Alaska Department of Fish and Game employees' radio antenna and then landed popping on jagged rocks. Finally, late on July 5th, Peninsula Air brought us a 19-foot, 300-pound Zodiac. The next day when we tried to leave camp, our short shank motors would not move the boat. Two days later, another plane brought us a smaller 15-foot Zodiac. 7 a.m. July 8th, with favorable weather, a rising tide, and Ed standing to see over all the gears stacked in the smaller boat, we headed to Pwali Bay. The huge seabird cliffs in Portage, Dry, and Pwali Bays collectively had more than 70,000 murs, the predominant species. We camped on a beach just inside Pwali Bay. From this camp, we could easily reach the offshore Kekernoi Islets, a sea lion roost of over 1,500. We listened for nocturnal seabirds, but heard nothing. At 1 a.m., after a nearly 20-hour day with drizzle fog moving in, low tide, and darkness, we picked our way through the exposed rock reefs and kelp back to camp, exhausted. On July 10th, we caught the early morning tide and returned to the Kekernoi Islets to check diurnal seabird colonies. Walking through the low tide zone, I yelled to Ed, Hey, fresh bear diggings in the sand! He was ahead and already on the island's grass-covered rock ridge. Suddenly, just 30 feet from Ed and right above me, a sow reared up and growled. I dashed to the boat for the shotgun, thinking the worst. I raced to where I had last seen Ed, gun ready. Meanwhile, Ed had slipped off the backside into shallow water and circled back to the boat. Luckily, the bear was gone and we were safe. Shaken, we headed for Alinchak Bay. The next day, we traveled through Cashvik Bay and watched a sow and two cubs amble along the beach. Bypassing Katmai Bay's broad sandy beach and crashing surf, we encountered 15 to 20 knot winds blowing against the low tide and exposed shoals sprinkled with crashing random breakers. Riding the breakers like a roller coaster with spray breaking over the bow, we rounded the point into Dakavak Bay. A bear on the island in Dakavak sent us on to Amalek Bay where we camped near an old dilapidated cabin. July 12th, we surveyed Geographic Harbor, a stunningly beautiful fjord that we did not really see due to the low clouds and driving rain. A big brown bear walked right past our rubber boat and camped that night. Finally, with a bit of sunshine, we explored Hidden Harbor, a deep, long fjord which opens into a beautiful secret cove. We picked up our gas cache on the way out and then went to the cormorant colony on Tackley Island. We saw loafing mew in Bonaparte's gulls and about 60 harbor seals, and another bear. We left for Mystic Bay on July 14, motoring past Kaflia Bay and into Kukak Bay to pick up another fuel cache at the old Kukak clam cannery ruins. 
Not many birds, just six bald eagle nests. Also another sow and two cubs. The shoreline was foul with rocks. We continued around Kukak Point and into Hallow Bay where we camped on Nanagiak Island. The island hosted about 2,500 pairs of tufted puffins, 1,000 pairs of horned puffins, and 2,500 pairs of glaucous winged gulls. 20 black oyster catchers were nesting on the island's beaches. We woke up to a flat boat, which luckily turned out to be a valve problem. July 16th was another miserable weather day, but with wind as well. On the 17th, we motored to Shakun Rock, a loafing area for hundreds of sea lions. Just a small kittiwake colony clung to one of the cliffs. Our camp that night was on Kuikpalak Island, an old cattle ranching island. Remains of a two-story house and sheds were near a pocket of spruce with a bald eagle nest. 6 a.m. on July 18th, with big swells running, we headed about three miles offshore to the Douglas Reef, where we counted roughly 860 loafing harbor seals. We rounded Cape Douglas and went into Sukhoi Bay. Several points further along the coast, we saw a walrus on a rock near a cormorant colony. We had seen one before on Mitrofania Island further to the west. On Shaw Island, we set our camp up on an exposed southeastern beach because the swells were too big to land on the more protected side. Shaw Island is fairly flat and covered with a glaucous-winged gull colony. We found numerous common eiders and red-throated loons nesting as well. The next day, we headed north along Kamishak Bay's coast. We raced the tide to Nordyke Island to camp. Tides go out so fast in this shallow bay that getting stuck in the middle of open water is a very real danger. At Nordyke Island, double-crested cormorants nested on adjacent islets. Glaucous-winged gulls abounded amidst the purplish-red fields of fireweed. At 2 p.m., when the tide was high enough to avoid getting stuck, we ran over to McNeil Cove. With an unusual sunny warm afternoon, we paddled into the lagoon once it flooded and checked in with Larry Allmiller, who was in charge of the McNeil Sanctuary. We were allowed to camp and await a pickup and also visit the McNeil Falls on standby with the permitted group. On July 21st, the fog returned. We had to wait five days for a pickup to return to Homer. Our preliminary survey along this coastline helped biologists identify key sites for long-term monitoring of population trends. Proper management of marine birds can follow based on assessments of long-term population fluctuations of seabirds in relation to commercial fishing, offshore oil exploration, and changes in climatic and oceanographic factors.